Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It is a pleasure to have Ashish Rajpaksha here with us. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few things um, for our audience members. We will begin with a short introduction um, before the talk. Through the talk and after, you're free to share your questions in the Q&A box. At the end of the lecture, I will collect all of the questions um, to moderate and Ashish can respond to them after the lecture. We will also post a few links and references um, in the chat box. So do keep an eye out for those. Uh, our guest today, of course, certainly needs no introduction for the most of us. Um, but I will attempt a brief um, summary of his critical and important work. Ashish Rajdaksha is a film historian and cultural theorist. He has written extensively on and widely curated film, video, visual art and performance works, archival histories and retrospectives. His work has traversed uh, critical film histories, internet cultures, uh, digital technologies and the constant tensions with and co-option in governance, legislation, and surveillance of the public sphere. His books include uh, Ritwik Khotak, A Return to the Epic, Indian Cinema in the Time of Celluloid, From Bollywood to the Emergency, The Last Cultural Mile, An Inquiry into Technology and Governance in India, and his most recent work, John Khotak Tarkovsky, Citizens, Filmmakers, Hackers, which was published in 2023. John Khotak Tarkovsky, Tarkovsky tells a longer story of the events of the 2015 student protests at the Film and Television Institute of India, or the FTII. It speaks of the technologies of digitization that altered governance, redefined the public domain, transformed citizenship through new modes of surveillance along a targeted delivery of services to beneficiaries. The book speaks of the transfiguration of the filmmaker into an increasingly invisible hacker of cinema turning to low resolution moving images and of how all of this redefined the student protests. Today's talk will reconsider these protests, which is of course one of the um, catalysts in the topic of the book, as a catalyst to extend an argument around cinema and its makers today. Thank you so much for being here with us, Ashish, and over to you now. Thank you very much, Arundhati, and uh, thanks to ASAP, um, the Alkazi Foundation, for having me. Um, thanks to Rahab, with whom one has had an ongoing um, set of projects and connections. So uh, it's really quite a, quite a pleasure to be here. Um, the book that uh, Arundhati mentioned, John Gata Tarkovsky, uh, I have a copy here for anyone who wants to, um, look at it, uh, is actually a very recent book, but it's actually about an incident that already seems to be quite a long time ago, 2015. Uh, it particularly deals with the strike that happened, but this particular presentation today isn't really going to be about that strike. I'll say a little bit about it, but we're really moving on. I'm trying to focus on a certain sort of cinema that I think is emerging uh, right now, um, that has emerged sort of since that time and which is increasingly in evidence uh, um, as as the, the years and months go by. Um, a couple of months ago, I was in Kerala in the International Documentary and Short Film Festival of Kerala, and I was completely, completely sort of uh, gobsmacked by a whole generation of films that seem to be made by young filmmakers that makes me really quite convinced that we're looking at yet another turn in documentary. We're looking at a fundamental transformation in what is documentary cinema. Uh, and among the films that I want to specifically mention are uh, Naushin Khan's film, uh, Land of My Dreams, which was uh, eventually the film that that won the, 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 the top award for the long form documentary, which is a film that's a very personal film, some ways set in the context of the events in Delhi of uh, late uh, 2019 and uh, 2020, um, particularly around Shaheen Bagh. Um, I also wanted to think of Arbab Ahmed's film, Insides and Outsides, um, which is, I mean, both these, and there are many, many other such films. In fact, some of them are very short films. Many of them are long films. Uh, some of them are in documentary form. Some of them are using music video forms. A lot of generic kind of 
uh, you know, crossover that, that one is seeing to define uh, what is clearly a certain kind of political cinema, but not political cinema in the sense in which we have understood political cinema's history. Uh, if political cinema defines a certain kind of radical practice intended to take you to the streets, intending to, I mean, that's at least the classical imagination of it, intending to get you, get you to rise up and revolt, all the standard armaments of what were, it seems like a century ago, uh, the armature of radical documentary film, you're getting something else here. Now, documentary cinema has, of course, had a long history in India. Um, not so long in one sense, but quite long now in another. We know that it is well recorded that independent documentary in India was born within the context of the emergency. So the post-emergency period is the first time when you start seeing serious, independent documentary film. And we know something of the impact that a lot of political incidents that have, that have followed have had on documentary, the Bhopal gas disaster, to take an example, Belchi or Bhagalpur, and in an enormous way, Godhra and the Gujarat riots, uh, the kind of impact that they had on documentary film um, in 2002 and after. What we are getting now, uh, I am proposing, is another turn to that history another form that we are seeing that is not even necessarily documentary in any classical sense of the term. What we're seeing here uh, and the examples that I've given earlier uh, are, are I think instances of that is a curiously quiet, introspective, personal cinema often turning inwards into an interior zone of some kind. Perhaps the one common feature to such cinema that we are seeing around us, and I want to propose that this particular kind of cinema that we're looking at is, is now sufficiently substantial to, to, to be taken seriously as a movement, is the fact that the protagonist of such cinema is no longer in front of, but really behind the camera. So it is almost the opposite of what used to be known until the other day as the observational mode of filmmaking. Uh, this particular protagonist is often behind and sometimes in front, but producing a kind of vacuum where the formal protagonist once was. Uh, and it is, it is it becomes a kind of an independent, absent space that becomes also an invitation, one might say, a challenge even to spectators to insert their gaze into the space, the space that was once occupied by a protagonist who had agency. Um, a specific little detour about the strike, Arundhati mentioned the strike itself, uh, and that, that becomes the kind of context within which the book was written, although the book really goes both back and, 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 and front. Uh, in June 2015, uh, students of the venerable Pune-based Fil Film and Television Institute of India went on a strike. That strike had a very specific reason. They were protesting the nomination of individuals to his governing council, whose only qualification to govern that particular premier film school appeared to be of a purely political nature. The strike was not intended to be very long. In fact, they were wondering when it started, whether it should be a symbol, symbolic strike of a day or, 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 or a week or just you know, over, the, over a weekend. It eventually lasted 139 days. Uh, and it had several difficult, painful, dramatic, deadly, and always complex negotiations with an intransigent state apparatus, violence, police intimidation, and legal harassment. The strike uh, would be conventionally seen to have failed, but failure in this case is an interesting development because failure doesn't lead to closure. Failure creates a long tail, and we're really looking at what might well be a, a very long durée history now of what happened in 2015. What that strike did, uh, I suggest uh, in this book, in a rather new way, was to pose a very old question in a new uh, arena. Uh, the question was the classic ontological question, what is cinema now brought to India? The strike was about film, it was about, it was by filmmakers, and it raised yet again several questions that have been central to cinema in India since at least late colonialism. Renewed after independence, after economic globalization, and now renewed in this political era that we are in today. They asked this question, it seems, within yet another change circumstance to do with academic freedom on the campus and the right to study, to make, and to show film on campus as a direct manifestation of that freedom. It is now important then to recognize how much the right to make and show films defined other political strikes uh, in or protests in other campuses, including Jadavpur University or, 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 or uh, JNU or Hyderabad. 
Some years earlier, students on the FTI campus had adopted a famous slogan originally produced by the Vietnam Solidarity Campaign in England, followed the Tet Offensive in 1968. That, that uh, slogan was, of course, Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh, We Shall Fight, We Shall Win, into now what became its specifically cinematic variation, Eisenstein, Pudov Kin, We Shall Fight, We Shall Win. Now, Sergei Mikhailovich Eisenstein and Sevilok Pudokin are iconic Soviet filmmakers and theorists and you know, essential film school study for anyone wanting to be filmmakers. And these names now took to the Indian streets along with, you know, Halla Pol and Awaz Do Ham Ek Hain. And they were soon joined by specifically Indian names, Ritwik Ghatak and John Abraham, to make for the slightly unrhymed but nevertheless effective line, John Ghatak Tarkovsky, We Shall Fight, We Shall Win. Now, what were John and Ghatak doing on the streets of Pune and then many other Indian cities? And what might they have said had they been with us about this kind of politics? What would they have had to say? Political cinema as a concept would have been not new to them. It was not, it's not new to Indian cinema by any means. Indeed, it's something that almost goes back to the history of cinema itself in, in India. And yet we were on the cusp of something that was quite unprecedented, something that might have taken John and Ghatak somewhat by surprise. Um, here I want to talk about expanded cinema, uh, the concept of expanded cinema, cinema that actually goes, becomes larger than itself. Uh, the concept of expanded cinema is now very well known in art contexts and, you know, the Tate Gallery, for example, which has been actually supporting uh, expanded cinema, has even a definition of it. They call it an immersive experience that challenges the one-way relationship between audience and screen. We will be looking at expanded cinema somewhat differently, but it is possible that our definition of expanded cinema and the more conventional one that the Tate Modern produces is, is both go back to the same, same origins, same points of origin. Uh, what is the point of origin? The point of origin is that it has been recognized ever since cinema was invented by art historians, for example, that cinemas in a larger sense, cinema spilling out into the streets defines modernity itself. You know, if at the end of the First World War, you have cinema taking roots as an industry, you also have uh, what art historian, I mean, someone like Arnold Hauser, for example, in the social history of art, calls the age of film, which is also a time of what he describes as a mass democracy, mass society, where the broad masses can have a share in political life. It is also a time when the masses become then the enemy of taste, the enemy uh, of, of high art, uh, and we are often single-handedly held responsible, again quoting Hauser, for the alienation and degradation of modern culture. So the fact that the cinema actually takes to the streets, the fact that the cinema is available to the masses in a way that the arts aren't or not necessarily, is seen as actually the problem of cinema. You know, this is the kind of cinema that needed cleaning up, it needed gentrification, it needed a certain kind of uh, um, uh, an, uh, a reinvention almost as it were, before it could occupy the same hallowed spaces as the other arts. Now, mass democracy has never been easy to achieve. Uh, it has been a political battle uh, and, and nowhere more so than in India, where several of the constitutional provisions that define Indian democracy have been under threat, forcing numerous battles to take place. Um, I think arguably from late colonialism and, and most certainly after independence. These battles have taken place on the street. These have taken place in courtrooms and amongst other places, uh, these have taken place in Indian, in movie theaters in India. Um, in the cinema, it would often be a battle over a definable entity named film, you know, an entity that could have a title, a name, a sense of certificate, as against a much more amorphous idea of cinema, an undefinable, unquantifiable, and eventually uncensorable moving image. Um, I just want to sort of shift to a very recent statement that was made in 2021, there was a report of the Committee of Experts to examine issues of certification under the Cinematograph Act of 1952. Um, this was uh, an effort to redefine, re rework uh, the Act uh, of 52 to suit new conditions. And Justice Mukul Mudgal, who chaired this particular committee, says something really interesting and significant. I'm quoting that report now. He says, there are few other means of communication that can claim rival levels of pervasive influence and presence in our daily lives. 
history shows that films have sparked off political debate and threatened governments, heralded social change, causing society to deviate from age-old dogma. It has also sent real-life lovers to their death in the misplaced hope of emulating the classic romances. And now comes the, the chilling line. He says, it is perhaps in salute to such impelling powers of persuasion that the cinema is the only form of art deemed fit to be regulated by an act of parliament. Um, it, it's surprising to, to note that there is no parliamentary act to define what a painting is, or there is no parliamentary act to define what is music, but there is a parliamentary act to define what is cinema. It is known as the Indian Cinematograph Act of 1952. And this is the act that now Mudgal and his team are now setting out to, to find ways to redefine. Um, we've always had a statist legalist idea of what is cinema. Um, you know, the state defining not what is this film or that film, but what is the cinema itself. Uh, in the late 1960s, the GD Khosla Committee on Film Censorship provided what might be the first fully legal theory of what is cinema. Um, it was a theory of what, what, what lawyers might call the medium. It is not, not, a, not a theory about content. It's actually about, about the medium of film, the cinema itself, the cinema as a whole. Its primary burden was to show that cinema had a vast capacity to incite, to provoke, and to lead to conditions that could provide a direct threat to public order. Okay. So the, the cinema was defined in legal terms as something that had the capacity to incite, to provoke, and to provide a threat to public order. In this particular sense, and now we're as, as we come into the present and we start looking at threats to public order as, as defining the conditions of censorship, in this sense, the censorship mechanism that has existed for the cinema, a mechanism that we might now call prior restraint, when you could stop a film from entering the public domain for fear of a possible future threat to public order, would pioneer an entire structure of legality uh, that has come to be known today as preventive action. So for example, today, if you can have internet shutdowns, or if you can place a curb on the right to free assembly, for example, as preventive measures against future threat, what you are doing is something that has happened in cinema a long time ago. Yeah. So the cinema now becomes a template for a much wider form of preventive restraint that we are seeing around us in India. Historically, uh, censorship has been a space of embattlement and amongst the many kinds of battles that have taken place over censorship have been technological battles. Uh, these have been battles over how the actual apparatus of censorship would in fact work in, in practice. You know, for example, you may be aware of the fact that uh, you know, when you made a film in 35 millimeter, uh, you were only permitted to make one print of the film and you had to take that particular print to the censor board and get a censor certificate. And when you, you know, you, when you brought that censor certificate back to the film lab, the lab would then allow you to make more than one print. So there was a particular way in which the censorship mechanism actually was able to control the production of 35 millimeter celluloid film. It wasn't so easy for it to control 16 millimeter. Uh, and we unfortunately never had a major movement of eight and super eight millimeter uh, for reasons that we may have to talk about separately. But when video, for example, comes in and now digital platforms comes in and then OTT comes in, you have a long history of forms uh, that could be held to account by the censorship mechanism and forms that could not. Right? So as you start getting an expanded idea of film production, you start getting also an expanded idea of censorship, which goes well beyond and, and, and is much larger than what the censor board for cinema tries to do. It was in 2000 that the Information Technology Act is, is passed and this act first defines what we may now call an expanded censorship or an expanded cinema, or more precisely the expansion of what was once cinema into all of the internet. The internet now defines uh, or uh, censorship of the internet now defines what is both considered reasonable restraint of free speech as well as new terms for prior restraint. So let me read, for example, in 2015, uh, the Shreya Singhal judgment that uh, 
that uh, takes place uh, around uh, sections uh, articles sorry sections uh, 66a and 69a of the information technology act this is what the attorney general now says in in his reasons for why he wants censorship of the internet uh, you will note that the the, the the similarity between this kind of argument and what used to be a colonial argument on censorship of cinema i'm quoting him he says the reach of print media is restricted to one state or at the most one country while internet has no boundaries and its reach is global uh, it used to be an argument about cinema that the cinema too had a hugely expanded reach it was not a reach that could be contained the recipient of free speech and expression used in a print media can only be literate people so literacy became one kind of barrier whereas internet can be accessed by literate and illiterate people both since one click is needed to download an objectionable post or video in the case of television serials and movies there is a permitted pre censorship that ensures the right of viewers not to receive any information which is dangerous while in the case of internet no such pre censorship is possible because and this is really an interesting line each individual each one of us is publisher printer producer director and broadcaster of the content without any statutory regulation so in a peculiar way in some sense as an extreme condition the extreme fear of the censor board all of us have become filmmakers because we all now carry devices that can capture films as well morphing of images change of voices and many other technologically advanced methods to create serious potential social disorder can be applied rumors can be spread you can invade the privacy of individuals use language and create serious social disorder by the mere click of a button uh while you know to watch a film you had to go to a theater to read a newspaper you had to acquire the newspaper or uh, to watch television you at least needed a room from where television is placed today the internet is 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 ubiquitous and a, a, a person abusing the internet can commit any offense at any place at any time of his choice while maintaining his anonymity in all cases now i have suggested in this book john gatta tarkovsky that much of this language is actually language taken directly from the cinema and much of it is language that was once attributed to the cinema uh, and in a sense this is now the ubiquitous language of censorship across the board mean including many many different uh, different practices using language then uh, we now have such language then we have a state apparatus creating a vastly expanded censorship for expanded cinema it would kick in the structure of censorship or what was once called censorship into another zone where prior restraint what was once prior restraint which was you know that the you had to you could stop a film from being shown actually extends into a much more diverse definition of what we might now call preventive detention all of it in the name of future harm this is then the context within which the films that we are making have to be seen um because these are films that are working with this kind of censorship um we've seen disruptions uh, and attacks on 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 filmmakers and attacks on the context of uh, attacks on film screening that uh, that 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 have taken place all around us a new era in disruption the history of disruption arose in 1972 uh, when a performance of a play by the playwright vijay tendulkar was closed down by a group of between 7 and 10 men at pune's bal gandharva rangamandir um this was a somewhat new thing that happened you know we hadn't quite known this form of disruption the disruptors claimed to be ordinary members of civil society who had been offended by the play's alleged immorality although it was an open secret at that time that the shivsena was most probably behind that attack plays by vijay tendulkar became as the years went on a significant target for attack some years later tendulkar when he was reflecting on this events said that there is nothing easier to interrupt than a play being staged you only needed to tell the performers not to do it or else and almost without exception you would succeed plays inside a stage inside an auditorium was simply too vulnerable to attack this was true not only of theater tendulkar suggests actually in that conversation that uh, such attacks can happen to anything material anything bound by time and place so for example in art if you show art in an art gallery the art gallery can be attacked if you show a film in a movie theater or if you show it in an auditorium the auditorium can be attacked especially if that event is is defined in a time and place if it has a if it has a date a schedule if it has extremely expensive equipment if there is a condition of authority that whose permission has to be taken before you do this 
Uh, this now included, as we come into the second decade of the 20th century, 21st century, to include film screenings. So, for example, when we saw the attack on Sanjay Kak's Jashne Azadi in Pune, or more famously in Akul Singh Sohni's Muzaffar Nagar Baki Hai in Delhi's Kiroonimal College in 2015, and uh, in 2013, importantly at the FTII, when um, students were attacked for showing Anand Patwardhan Jai Bhim Comrade and inviting the Kabir Kala Manch to perform, they were also attacked at that point of time. Performances and infrastructure heavy auditoria were static in the way that they were authored, starred, named, dated, and located. Such performances were entirely reliant on the support of a hierarchical structure of authority. It was rarely the audiences that caused the problem, said Tendulkar, disturbed as they might have been. The disruption was always by others, initiated by people who picked such events up only because the venues were so completely fragile, the personnel so utterly vulnerable. What we now got as a result of this particular vulnerability was a new kind of cinema, as we got a new kind of art, as we got maybe a new kind of theater, or maybe a whole new series of art practices, moving from the static to the mobile, from the scheduled to the unscheduled, from the formal to the informal, and from heavy infrastructure to none at all. Eventually, from the known to the anonymous, from the named film director to the hacker, says the book, signifying a larger millennial transformation of the public political event itself from organized morchas to informal forms of protest, from occupy movements to completely fluid movements, or as the Hong Kong protesters of 2019 got described it, to be water. Across the, the late 90s and early 2000s, we saw a fluid protest that was in large measure a response to the growing dangers of a shrinking public sphere that offered few of the historical guarantees of public safety. So this then, uh, along with an expanded definition of censorship and a, a, form, a kind of an informal con condition of filmmaking, and you know, this particular situation of the public domain and protests in the public domain that I think defines the context of the sort of uh, sort of cinema that I'm trying to define here within expanded uh, the expanded cinema context. All of which bring, brings me, and this will be my proposition, uh, which I'd like to put, make open for public discussion here, to a new aesthetic practice of our present, which I think the films that I've mentioned earlier define. Uh, and which I think I want to now read into some of the outcomes of the FTI strike of 2015. It concerns a cinema that seemed till 2005, since 2015 and till now, as former students of the FTI turn ex-students and as they make their films after passing out of the campus, to produce what I want to now describe as a totalitarian everyday. It's a condition of, to quote Brecht, it's a condition of normality under extraordinary circumstances. It's, these are not radical films about radical times. This is a kind of a cinema of the everyday. In addition to the films that I've mentioned, I'm specifically thinking of films like Pratik Vats's film, Eve Ale U, or uh, in fact, Vats's own remarkable student film, Kal Pandra August Dukan Band Rehegi, or uh, Kisle's Aise Hi, uh, Arun Karthik's Nasir, or Payal Kapadia's A Night of Knowing Nothing. I use the term totalitarian advisedly here, and I have increasingly started using the term totalitarian here. I don't use the word fascist, authoritarian, or dictatorial, all these other terms that are also in, in, in around us. I use the term totalitarian advisedly and have very much of Hannah Arendt in mind when I do this. Uh, as you know, she speaks of the origins of the modern nation state, and in her instance, she speaks of anti-Semitism, and in ours, we do not have to outline who the hatred is against. Uh, a kind of what she describes enlightened despotism premised on inequality, on a new political hierarchy defined in opposition, always defined in opposition to an other. So what we now get in the kind of cinema that I'm talking about that is arise, that is coming up around us, uh, a cinema that's literally being formed as we speak, and the kind of cinema that I saw uh, in, 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 in large measure in the IDSFFK in Kerala, and I've seen in many, many other contexts, almost all of them informal, is a cinema that is light in weight. I refer not only to actual lightweight equipment that allows you to film on the streets, often in covert ways, to edit and to do post-production in an informal way, but it is a cinema that is actually light in image. You know, It is a cinema that allows lightweight circulation 
on streaming platforms. So you can actually compress these films in fairly low resolution forms. And the aesthetic of these films accommodates that kind of structure. Where the narrative logic that takes place accrues meaning through circulation. Yeah. So uh, such cinema very, very often works with found footage. And, you know, we have a kind of a plethora of found footage around us. And as this particular book argues, uh, the cinema works with what I have termed the hollow center, a vacuum in which the protagonist, where the protagonist once was, uh, and in which, you know, uh, we are, into which we are invited to insert our gaze as spectators. It's a, it's a somewhat, shall we say, uncharted territory into which spectators are invited to, to enter, as it were. Across the arts, the emphasis on lightweight mobility has come to be a central feature in protest arts as it moves from strategy to tactics, rendering the phenomenon of resistance fleeting, ephemeral, and subject to continual morphing to perform an intervention, which could be the access of, you know, sudden uh, access to a space, to a server, to a URL, and just as suddenly to disperse. Huh? If the actual content, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quoting here the Mukul Mudgal committee. Mukul Mudgal now wanted, uh, just as he recognized the concept of an expanded cinema, he also wanted a kind of an expanded censorship that would take care of this kind of cinema. And I'm quoting the Mudgal committee here. If the actual content of the film which is being screened at precise cinema location is subject to certification, then as a natural corollary, he says, all the ancillary material that is produced by such cinema should also be certified, such as posters and film materials which are displayed everywhere. Uh, and he says, in the public domain and everything that comes out from the film must also be subject to some form of check regulation and certification. Even as I was working on this presentation, um, uh, sometime in early August, uh, when we started talking about this presentation, the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill was passed. Uh, although it had significantly changed from its 2019 version, it retains several anxieties of what we might now call the data principle, using the terms from there, which were probably the filmmaker not long ago, the, the first maker of the moving image, and a series of data fiduciaries or all those individuals and institutions through whom the data mediates as it circulates in society. Although we have now got new amendments to the Cinematograph Act, uh, we, we have been saved by one particular incredibly draconian provision through a spirited campaign by a number of independent filmmakers that might have allowed the state to override said certificates issued by censors. We also have a digital media ethics code to govern OTT platforms. And of course, there is the enduring impact of 69A of the Information Technology Act under which takedown requests to social media platforms are rife. We are all aware of the fact that India has the largest record of, of, of takedown requests to uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and, and, and many, many other such platforms. I let me ask in conclusion then as to whether the public of 2023 for all its definition sameness over the century, the same as it had been, say, after the Second World War. Perhaps the true question that now emerged was not how much the public had changed, but whether a single definition exists any longer for the film spectator or has, along with the diversified and fragmented filmmaker, the spectator too become an abstraction, a ghostly spectator everywhere and nowhere, both visible and invisible. What the cinema could do, it seems, was to produce effects, montage forms, we may say, that may not have surprised Eisenstein in the way they seem no longer to be contained by the film, but spilled over outside the movie theater into signifiers that could not be regulated, policed, or censored. Thank you very much. <laughs>